Does mulching increase slug and snail problems in our garden? Is cross-pollination an issue when we let plants self-seed? And how do we rotate crops in our polyculture beds? I'll answer these questions in today's video. Many people are reluctant to mulch their gardens for fear of attracting slugs and snails. And I'm often asked if these pests are a problem in our garden, since we mulch with wood chips, autumn leaves, chop and drop garden waste, and more. Fortunately, snails were never a problem in our garden, but slugs years ago used to cause quite a bit of damage. However, though this may seem counterintuitive, slug damage has steadily decreased over the years as we've used more and more mulch. And at this point, slugs are at worst a minor nuisance. So the simple answer to the question is that mulching has not created a slug problem in our garden. In fact, we have far fewer slugs after many years of mulching. But to try to better understand what's going on, I turned to the Garden Professor's Blog Facebook page, and one possibility was offered by Dr. Linda Chalker Scott. It may only be coincidental, but wood chip mulches are great habitat for predaceous ground beetles, which eat both slugs and slug eggs. Doing a little more digging, I learned that centipedes also thrive in mulch and prey on slugs. So though I can't say for sure, mulching may have actually reduced our slug population by providing an excellent habitat for slug predators. Another interesting tidbit I picked up from the garden professors is that our native slugs prefer decaying organic matter over living plants. So mulching may reduce damage to plants by giving slugs an alternative food source they prefer over living plants. I'm curious to hear about your experiences using mulch. Did you notice differences in slug and snail populations over time? Please let me know in a comment below. For many years, we've allowed greens in this area of the garden to self-seed. This has prompted a number of you to ask about cross-pollination. Do we do anything to prevent it? And have we seen new varieties as a result of cross-pollination? As a rule, I don't do anything to prevent cross-pollination of our greens for a couple of reasons. First, it's important to note that only varieties from the same species can cross-pollinate. So plants like mosh, claytonia, red bean sorrel, good king henry, french sorrel, and sea kale will not cross-pollinate because there aren't other varieties from the same species in the area. And because these plants, like all other plants in our polyculture beds, are heirlooms, they stay true to type from one generation to the next. The second reason I'm not too concerned about cross-pollination is that we've been happy with the crosses that we have seen, and they've never totally replaced the original variety, even after years of self-seeding. Giant red mustards are a great example. We planted them many years ago, and we do see crosses with other mustard greens. But we still have loads of apparently true-to-type giant red mustards every spring and fall. As a rule, when saving seeds, you have to be very careful to prevent brassicas like kale, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, and brussels sprouts from cross-pollinating. However, the only brassicas that have gone to seed this spring are kale and collards, and we don't really mind if they cross. If a favorite variety like dinosaur kale was ever lost to cross-pollination, we simply buy new seeds, plant them, and start all over again. The next question is how do we rotate crops in polyculture beds like this one? Though we do some crop rotation in beds that are kind of a blend between polyculture and traditional plantings, we don't rotate crops in our polyculture beds. To better understand why, let's talk about what crop rotation is and what it accomplishes. Crop rotation is when you don't plant the same crop in the same area over a sequence of seasons. Instead, you rotate through a series of unrelated crops or no crop at all. Crop rotation is critical when growing in monocultures and is a response to problems that are exacerbated by monocultures, such as pests, diseases, loss of soil fertility, and erosion. Depending on the strategy used, the same family of crops might only be planted in the same area every other year, every four years, or even every eight years. As you can imagine, if you grow a lot of crops in a small garden, Rotating crops can be very challenging. But instead of growing in monocultures, we grow as much as possible in polycultures. When crops are interplanted with a wide variety of unrelated plants, they're less prone to the problems associated with monocultures, and there's less of a need for crop rotation. Pests and pathogens thrive in a field where the same crop is grown year after year. With their food source readily available, Pests take up residence and lay their eggs, and soil-borne pathogens become well-established. Crop rotation helps by removing the food source for pests and the host for pathogens. But in polycultures, pests have more difficulty locating their target crops, and beneficial insects, including pest predators, 
are attracted to the diversity of plants and they help reduce pest numbers. And pathogens without a concentration of hosts are less likely to take hold. Of course, that's not to say our garden is pest free. You may have noticed we have cabbage moths flying all over the place. But when I observe them, they appear to be having a hard time finding cabbage family plants to lay their eggs. Here's one checking out the peas and another sniffing around the potatoes. And when I examine our cabbage family plants like kale, we find very few cabbage worms on them. And the plant damage we do find is relatively minor. And I should point out that we get these results without using pesticides. Another problem that results from growing the same crop in the same field year after year is that the soil is depleted of the specific nutrients needed by that crop, resulting in a loss of soil fertility. Interplanting a broad diversity of unrelated plants, on the other hand, is less likely to result in a deficit of specific nutrients in the soil. And we found that compost, vermicompost, and mulch from free local resources have been more than enough to replenish them. Finally, crop rotation reduces soil erosion by following shallow-rooted crops like lettuce and spinach with deep-rooted crops that hold the soil. But in our garden, we interplant deep and shallow-rooted plants together so there's no need to rotate crops to prevent soil erosion. After nearly a decade of growing in a polyculture in this part of the garden, we don't see any of the problems associated with monocultures that make crop rotation necessary. The soil remains fertile, there are very few pest problems, the plants are essentially disease-free, and there's no soil erosion. Because rotating crops in a small garden can be very challenging due to space restrictions, I see polycultures as a great tool to lessen the problems associated with monocultures and minimize the amount of crop rotation required. We still do some crop rotation in beds that are a blend of polyculture and more traditional plantings, but not nearly as much as we'd have to if we had one bed for tomatoes, one bed for squash, one bed for brassicas, one bed for onions, and so on. I hope this video answers some of your questions about slugs, snails, mulching, self-seeding greens, and crop rotation. If you liked the video, please give it a thumbs up. And if you haven't already, Please subscribe for more videos on how to grow a lot of food on a little land without spending too much or working harder than you really have to.